John, you, I know, have known each other for many years mm -hmm. and serve on various organizations together. But I think it's really interesting that you have Turner, which is in the process of being acquired by, um, owned by Time Warner, in the process of being acquired by AT&T. And then you have a &E, which is a joint venture between uh, Disney and Hearst, which is really going it alone right now. Um, and so sort of different perspectives. You have sports. You don't. You're sort of part of the non-sports bundle. So I want to dig into all this, but first I have to get it, get the elephant in the room out of the way, which is Amazon. Mm -hmm. You were up for the Amazon Studios job. You're not no, I didn't going get to a Amazon. good recommendation from John, so <laughs> I'm, um, I'm out. But um, look, I, in all seriousness... He does not need a recommendation from me. In all seriousness, I'm, you know, Jen is a fantastic person for this job. I'm thrilled to see a woman in it. The timing for me as CEO of a &E isn't wasn't right. Um, I'm sort of known as an East Coast person. And I think now the job is everybody get behind her, and we need to see a woman as the head of a big studio be wildly successful. That's a great answer. <laughs> um, and, and just before we move on to all of the other stuff, was there anything that you learned going through that process about Amazon or the changing landscape that was particularly surprising? No. Um, so moving on. I have took notes yeah. with Peter Rice yeah. yesterday. Yeah. So yeah. Keep asking. <laughs> um, well, so I have look. something to say about Amazon. Okay. They need to grow up if they want to be in the video business. And what do you mean grow up? They need to commit. To spending more money yeah. or your they money They need to commit an investment of talent. And they, look, part of, I think, the theme of what at least I'm thinking about right now is competing as Turner which is a pretty successful large-scale video content company, but competing against the likes of Facebook and Apple and Amazon and Netflix, like they are the giants. Uh, and Amazon has had some success critically, but they haven't really committed. And I hope they don't. You hope they don't invest <laughs> billions more to compete with I, you. You know, I would rather they continue to do what they're doing. But uh, it's not that I'm um, degrading the success that they've had, but they haven't exactly committed. And, uh, and if they do, well, then that will continue to tilt the competitive landscape. What would define commitment from Amazon? Is it a certain number of billions? I think it's, I think it's price and talent. It's not just money but it's, it's commitment. Well, one of the reasons why this is so important, the consolidation And I'm sorry, question. if you disagree, let me know. Like, I... No, I, mean, I think, look, it's, it's um, to me, from a point of view of a and Networks, you know, we're not gonna spend six, 12, 15, 20 billion dollars on content, but that doesn't mean that, you know, he who spends the most is the most successful. I agree with that. I think strategy is critical to this, and culture is critical, and, um, if you don't have a great culture that nurtures creative talent, if you don't know the audience that you're talking to, and if you don't have a strategy of how to talk to them, where to talk to them, and when to talk to them, then you can be wasting an awful lot of money. So I totally agree. I with think that. we put the headline up there a lot, and we don't talk about the smart behind the headline. Mm -hmm. But isn't one of the issues when you're looking competing with Amazon is that Amazon is working on a different metric, right? They're looking to lure people into Amazon Prime and get them to feel like there's enough cool content that Amazon Prime has sort of extra value in addition to just free shipping. So you're you're competing with different things. You're worrying about ratings and ad dollars and yeah, they're making, absolutely yeah. different businesses. That was touched on yesterday. I mean, you know the the ISP delivered content businesses are valued differently than the traditional media businesses, but we're wildly profitable. I mean, John and I could both share that in common, um, and that you know. We're, look, we've had HBO forever. This has been the complaint forever, right? You know, you, you, we do a show, they did Sopranos, the ratings are different, the distribution is different, but they don't, they're not ad supported. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we are fundamentally in an ad supported business that is different than a lot of our competitors. And one of the reasons I think we're seeing so much consolidation is because of the rise of the Amazons and Netflix of the world putting pressure on the traditional media models. And so I have to ask with the, uh, the, the pending DOJ lawsuit, uh, trying to block, uh, I think there's a, uh, the next big event in the DOJ lawsuit to block at and acquisition of Time Warner's in a month. Um, how confident are you that this deal is going to go through? I think the government is clueless. 
What do you mean by that? That's a good headline. <laughs> it's true. And as a person who's actually going through the process and has been in depositions, the theory of the case just makes absolutely no sense. None. So in the history of this country, what vertical merger has tilted the landscape of the competitive environment? Let me give you the answer. Zero. So for us, we're on a strategy at Turner to continue to enhance our brands and grow. And we think combining with AT&T will help us do that. But if you think about since the announcement of the AT&T deal, DirecTV has lost 1.3 million full paying subscribers. They have this little business called DirecTV Now, which they make no money on any incremental subscribers. So let's put that away, because if you're in a business where you make no money on subscribers, that's not a good business. So in the same time, in the United States, Netflix has added 6 million subscribers. And if you look at the market caps, which basically Wall Street values every single day what's happening, AT&T, since the announcement of the Time Warner merger, has zero grown. They're flat. Um, and I think Amazon and Google have essentially added, in terms of market cap, the equivalent of AT&T. And Facebook has added the equivalent of two times Time Warner. So if you're the government and you're worried about fixing the competitive landscape, what are you worried about? Like, it is a massive misallocation of resources and capital to fight this thing. They're going to lose. But do you think they will lose with concessions made? Do you I don't think know. that Time Warner will have to sell have, something uh, look, off? Look, the, the good thing about me making these comments is I have no idea what I'm talking about. <laughs> so... <laughs> What, but what about CNN? Turner owns CNN. Do you think CNN will have to be sold as part of this deal? I, I don't think so. I don't believe so. I'm, you know, Randall Stevenson has been public about the fact that, that CNN will not be sold. Uh, and, but I, you know, we have an army of people who are incredibly talented and, and uh, are working hard towards making the outcome what they think it should be. So I don't, you know, I don't know. And that's before that's we, not what I get paid. Yeah, for. before we move on from this topic, though, I have to ask, what's plan B? What if the deal does not go through? Look, I think plan B is, I don't know what plan B is, because my boss, Jeff Bukas, the chairman and CEO of Time Warner, will ultimately determine what plan B is with the board of directors of Time Warner. But from our standpoint at Turner, which is more than the half of the profits of Time Warner, we're doing great. Like, so... Yes, we think that AT&T, a combination, can supercharge our ability to get to our strategic goals. But if it doesn't work, we're going to be fine. And whatever plan B is, we're prepared. You know, Time Warner is a pretty stable, big, successful company. So, I mean, HBO is on fire right now. Warner Brothers had its most successful year in its history in 2017. We did, too. Uh, and so whatever happens, happens. You know, I'm, I actually think the... You know, uh, the future is really bright, uh, no matter what happens. Nancy, looking at your business and the consolidation around it, does it make sense to, to stay a joint venture like this? Would you rather be bought out by, by say, Disney and, and have more investment from them? Look, I think, you know, they have their hands full at the moment, and I think what, what's going on there will play out accordingly. Um, you know, we are, what happens to us as a joint venture is completely up to the board of directors of, of a and &E Networks and obviously the partners being Disney and Hearst. Um, I will say though that I think they're pretty happy with the performance and they are happy with, um, you know, the progress that we're making. They know these are strong brands and, you know, it's not something that at the moment um, has to be addressed. We have very strong distribution deals for uh, quite a while, um, you know, we don't have anything imminent that would really c call into question what's our strategy going to be. Um, and I think that there may be a real opportunity, too, in being a little smaller and a little nimble while every other company around us is going through massive integration challenges, which should never be underestimated. And that, you know, we can move a lot quicker 
um, and we can address clients' needs as everybody else is sort of struggling uh, through the distraction of this. And this is a huge distraction. I, I mean, it's, it is. we're not even part of it, and it's a distraction. And so, <laughs> you know, I think that that's, that's something that I keep sort of reminding my team day in, day out. We have to see this as a huge opportunity to accelerate our progress while everybody else is thinking about other things. And an opportunity in terms of attracting creators? Just being able to move quicker. I mean, look, a lot of, from a distribution standpoint, we're you know quite healthy. We're seeing, I agree with what Peter Rice said, we're seeing a real leveling out um, where the traditional subscriber losses are slowing and the digital uh, MVPD gains that we're seeing through things like DirecTV Now and Sling and Hulu are starting to make up for that. And so, you know, that creates some stability, you know, not, no one's got their head in the sand, but some stability on one side of the house. And now the other side of the house has to really be about ratings points and advertiser solutions. And how do we expand our capabilities to not just be in this, you know, the 30 second or 15 second spot business, but instead to really understand solutions for clients and to act almost like agencies. You know, you're American Express and you have an RFP and you need to move your man 25 to 40 from the green card to the silver card. Okay, I can come back to you and tell you how I can do that across my entire portfolio. Black? Yeah, I, I never got invited to be in the black card. I was like, what the hell? But the, um, the, you know, being able to do that across all of the impressions and opportunities that we have, not just tie it to a show. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's the old way of thinking is, well, this show delivers that audience, here you go. And we're trying to say, well, we have an investment in Atlas Obscura and they can offer a trip to this, you know, the adventure travel to this specific guy where there's a, you know, there's a call to action for that card. There are also sponsorships. There are, there's short form series that can be done. So really a much rethinking different that, rethinking what our capabilities are and trying to get the company, and we've been quite successful at it lately, to understand like, oh yeah, we produce content and we're marketers, you know, ah, uh, duh. <laughs> and we, you forgot a little of that muscle in the hyper growth period of cable. Um, you're taking different approaches towards the, the digital distribution. So we've launched uh, Boomerang, which is a kids direct to consumer service, which is in partnership between Cartoon Network and Christina's here, I see you, uh, who runs Cartoon Network and does an amazing job and, uh, and Warner Brothers. Mm -hmm. um, and we've got in a very, very short period of time, close to 150,000 subscribers. And we've got Filmstruck, which is a classic movie library service similar to uh, Turner Classic Movies. And what it is, it's providing not only an incremental new revenue stream, but just as importantly, uh, a learning experience as it relates to what the future of this business is going to be, which is going to be tapping into fandom and finding people who are incredibly energized by the services that you provide and the brands that you have. And brands are not going to disappear. I mean, a lot of people say, oh, well, the world is just going to move to a Netflix ch like show business. I don't believe that at all. Like the idea of curation is going to be just as important, if not even more important in the future, as people try to navigate what is only an increasing amount of choice to something that they can find and identify with and really get behind. And so I think the future of Turner uh, is really, over time, being responsible for controlling the consumer experience from start to finish. And if you think about the business that Nancy, you're in, I'm in, we have outsourced the experience uh, to cable satellite telco companies. That, they have let us down. 
And one of the reasons why Netflix Even though one been, of them is buying you now. Well, yeah, I have direct TV. I live in Beverly Hills. It's not that good. So they have not innovated quickly enough. And the over-the-top providers, because they don't have legacy technology issues, they don't have legacy boxes in homes, like they have innovated, and they are ubiquitous, and they are easy. And so we, as programmers, are going to need to take responsibility to essentially control the end-to-end -end consumer experience. And I don't exactly know what that means, whether there are, in the future there's a Time Warner bundle and a Disney bundle or, you know, an A&E bundle or, I don't know what exactly that means, but the idea of us relying on small rural cable operators to provide a great consumer experience is ridiculous. And we have too many commercials. So we're in an ad-supported business, which makes this slightly awkward. But we have taken the step to say we need to limit the amount of commercial interruption, which means we have to take the responsibility to make the commercials that we have relevant and entertaining and interesting. But we can't, you know, my worst fear of the future is by the time the advertising agencies and the marketers figure out how to improve advertisements, nobody's going to be watching anymore because they're all going to be on non-advertising supported platforms. So we're moving quickly and we're making great progress. But that's, I think, the biggest challenge that we have is that understanding there was always this argument of is, is content king, is distribution king? The answer is neither one. Because there's the third leg of the stool now, which is the consumer experience. And so we need to improve the consumer experience at the same time we make great content and we engage fans and, and figure out more and more ways to engage fans. And so I think, look, I love the chances that both of our companies have at doing that because we have great brands and the, the ability to create incredibly engaged storytelling. And, and so you, your, your channels are all included in Philo. I know the CEO of Philo is yep. here today. Yep. And um, that's sort of a new type of bundle. But I think what you're describing, there, you know, there are going to be bundles, skinny bundles, mm -hmm. different bundles. Yeah, the strategy that we have is get in every bundle, any bundle. I'll take any bundle. But, put me in it. But, but, the, but the risk <laughs> for, your, for your channels, though, but you is that get paid. You, you don't want to be... Well, the implication is that if I'm in the bundle, I'll oh, be paid. Okay. So. Uh, but you don't not want, three bundles. Well, isn't there a risk of your channels being squeezed out of skinny bundles, and that's why you're in Philo? Because I think that there's an, that's a pretty big assumption that people made, and it's, you're not seeing the economics of that. So yeah, sports and news are important, but so is what the customer wants. And two of our networks are in the top 10 of the audience delivery for cable. And that when you look at the value proposition, um, you know, and three of them are in the top 16. So when you look at the value proposition of all of those consumers that are, whose eyeballs are watching our brands and who are buying Cox or Charter or DirecTV, wherever they need to be bought, you know, and then you look at the price ratio of what some portfolios are charging versus what we're charging, we're almost a necessity to be in those bundles because we're delivering uh, high value brands to the audience at reasonable economics. Yesterday, Peter Rice talked about these new digital digital bundles compensating for traditional TV declines, almost sort of eliminating the, yeah, the loss of that there. too. And how important, um, is something like Philo, which is really focused on the on the non-news, non-sport. Yeah, I mean, I think that they're all going to be important. Where it so it, is it bad out. that I haven't even heard of them? But the, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. They are. The, so I guess we're in the news bundle, and sports business. So. A bundle yeah. that went the route of just doing entertainment. Yeah. Not news so and it's sports. Discovery, Scripps, um, A E channels. It's sort of everything but news AMC. and sports. Oh, so they. Sorry, AMC, AMC, AMC. AMC. We well, have AMC, sports yeah. and news. Uh, so we're on the we're on the naughty list. No, you're um, right. How do you think all this? I, uh, before we talk more about consolidation, though, do you think CBS and Viacom are going to merge? Uh, I do. Yeah, I think they have to go back together. They have to get back together. Who else is going to merge? What other what other M and A will we see? I don't know. 
How does all of that change your business? Does it put pressure on you? I mean, I think, look, you could spend all day thinking about the combinations and permutations of who might buy whom and what's going to happen. And mm -hmm. look, at the end of the day, I have a responsibility to the 1,500 employees that you know we have and to the partners who I deliver a return to, to focus on the business at yeah. hand and to not be distracted by the noise and to, and to grow what we have and to sort of morph the company with an eye towards the future of what the landscape is gonna look like. And I think we all have challenges and you know, John said it best, it's, it's easy when you can build it from the ground up and the likeness that it needs to be today. Mm -hmm. It's very difficult when you have you know, billions of dollars and Janice said it earlier, the pennies for dollars, you, know, you have billions of dollars on the line and, and you can't just have your whole, or, whole organization go look at the pennies versus the dollars. And so it's this duality of trying to manage for today and tomorrow, but I don't get caught up in thinking about who's gonna do what with whom. Look, we've got a job to do, a business plan to hit, and that's what we're focused on. There's been so much talk in the, in the media about the value of live sports. You just had the Super Bowl, we have the Olympics going on now. You've made a lot of investments in, in sports rights. Um, yesterday I talked to Peter Rice about the fact that they're paying 30% more for each Thursday night game. Um, you don't know have sports. Do you think all these- I have live PD. <laughs> so um, it's the number one show in cable on Friday and Saturday nights. So it, um, it proves fans. to the guys that fans. it's not all about sports um, and that, you know, with creativity and persistence, we can be, we can win too. I mean, the funny thing about that show is we discovered through the Viz Vizio, um, came out with a study um, that we weren't even aware of in December that it's also the most DVR'd show. So who knows why that live DVR, I don't know. But when you, th when, you, when you think about that, do you think that all the other players like Turner are overpaying for sports rights? Um, ahead, look, I think don't hold it's a, <laughs> I, I think, no, I don't. I mean, it's, it's critical content and, and IP that is unreplicable is very, very hard to yeah. find. And that's what you found in these sports and, and you're playing a different, different game, different league, so to speak. Um, and look, we would love to have the NFL, not in the cards with, you know, our current partnership. But if you have a, an asset that can't be replicated, that's where the value you have to you know, what kind of multiple you put on that and how you ascribe value to that is really challenging. Yeah. What do you think of the, the sports rights prices going up as ratings go down for the NFL? Well, our ratings, and this is going to sound, and I don't mean to sound defensive about this, our ratings are not going down. Yeah. I was just referring to the NFL ratings. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I think what is happening with the NFL is specific to them and the mm -hmm. league. And by the way, whatever they're doing and Roger Goodell is doing is great for the NFL because they're getting a lot more money. And it may be that there is a little bit too much fatigue in terms of the availability of, of, of NFL games. Mm -hmm. But you know, year to date, our NBA ratings are up. Um, we're looking forward to an incredible March Madness tournament, which is coming up in the next month. And, and I think baseball was way up. This and year. baseball was, was way up. Um, we we unfortunately, we had the playoffs, not the World Series, but mm -hmm. our playoffs were up and the World Series was way up because it was a great matchup. Um, but, you know, we, in, and this preceded me, so this was not my strategy, but Turner has always tried to invest in sports that matter and not over-invest and always try to invest in a way you, where you could make money. Um, we're, it's almost time for audience questions, but I want to talk about your investments in some of these startups. You've invested in BeautyCon, which I think is interesting, but also in the, the, the big one, Vice. Mm -hmm. um, and you're, I believe, on the board um, of Vice as well. Um, I guess, first I have to ask sort of why you like making these investments and what you feel like you've learned and what you brought to a &E as a result of these. I mean, well, Kevin Mayer was definitely a big part of the mm -hmm. Vice investment. Um, and you know, I think it, it was originally, we saw a long time ago the challenges with the smaller channels in the bundle, right? And mm -hmm. that we had something called H2, a network that was you know, really successful, but from the seat that I sat in looking out 10 years, um, a cable operator or a satellite provider, a telco provider was going to give me a hard time for paying for two history channels if the bundle was getting smaller. And so how did we, how could we look at that asset 
um, and actually innovate with cable operators and satellite providers to say, look, where are the gaps that you have in audience delivery? Who are the who are the consumers that you're not reaching? And what is a what is a fit for us? And so the Vice investment really came to be around converting a channel mm -hmm. to try and reach millennial audiences. It's a little bit the you know build it and they will come chicken and the egg thing. And people say, well, millennials aren't watching television. You look at the television landscape. There's not a heck of a lot of content being produced for millennials either. So you know the gamble was um, we can provide a brand. Um, and really, actually, that brand is being aggressively marketed by HBO. So we had yeah. very limited marketing to do because it was being propped up by um, the license agreement over there. It also had a very strong digital brand. Um, and it seemed like a, a valuable hedge for us into the future looking out around what was our bouquet of channels going to look like in 10 years and where were we going to try and generate some value. And so from a distribution standpoint, it was quite a smart move. Now, Vice has obviously come under criticism for some of the management issues, questions about gender discrimination, a bro -y culture that's bad for women. Here you are, a female CEO on their board, what have they done wrong, and are they doing enough to fix it? I don't think they're alone. So the bro -y culture is pervasive in our business. And so I will give um, hats off to them for actually coming out and forming the council, the DNI council, with a very impressive roster of women, Tina Chen and Robbie Kaplan and Gloria Steinem and Alyssa Mastronomico. That, that was done before the Weinstein of it all, frankly. So. Um, and he, he, I th they're not trying to hide from this issue. Um, they've come out and declared pay equity by the end of 18. They've come out and talked about 50-50 by 2020. He's brought in um, new HR leadership and turned a lot of the cultural decisions of Vice over to this DNI council, as well as the new head of HR and their new their CFO, who also has gained the COO title, Sarah, um, who is also a strong female leader there. Um, we're not giving Shane and or Vice a free pass at all. Um, but I would also look around and ask the media in the reporting on these things, well, you know, who else is making declarations of what they're going to do to change? And he made a declaration, and, and hopefully they get there, but I'll give him props for at least taking that step. And seeing the changes that were... It doesn't happen overnight. Yeah. It does, none of this is going to happen overnight, and I think... Even if you look at how young this movement is, whether it's Me Too or Time's Up or any of it, like we're inside 60 days. Mm -hmm. Any comments on the, the need for changes in culture? How do you address these issues at Turner? Uh, well, uh, look, we've, um, we have a zero tolerance policy. And uh, I think if there is anything that is good that has come from this, and we can thank Harvey Weinstein for this, is it has elevated the conversation to a point where this is not going to be tolerated anymore. And at Turner, whenever something like this has come up, and it's been very rare, but it does come up, we've, we've dealt with it. Uh, and there is, you know, I, I speak a lot to our employees, and a lot of what I've spoke about the last couple of years has been about diversity and inclusion. And now we're adding a third word to that, which is respect. And every day when people come to work, they deserve to be respected, whether they're a woman, a man, transgender, like it doesn't matter. And so it's... Uh, it's disheartening to hear about these cases that come up and people's bad behavior, but if it raises the awareness and if it makes companies tighten up what their policies are and, and if it raises the ability for everyone in the workplace, everyone to be respected, then this was actually a blessing. It will be really interesting to see how the conversation is changed a year from now when hopefully we're all back yes. here. Um, so I want to open up to a couple questions. Do we have any questions? Uh-oh. Uh-oh, Rich Greenfield from BTIG. <laughs> Please don't. No. I, have a, I have a philosophical question. Rich, like seriously, dude, you're going to ask a question? Like, so, <laughs> so compensation. Uh, uh, you know, both of you are both well compensated, but your compensation, I assume, probably not enough. I'm helping you. 
if someone's listening, hopefully, John. Thank you, Rich. Um, I won't get into pay equity. <laughs> <laughs> Please do. Bring it on, Rich. <laughs> I, I actually was not planning on going there at all, Nancy. <laughs> so you, you're both of your compensations is, uh, you know, w without getting into specific details, is tied to growing earnings and free cash flow and lots of financial metrics. When you look at a competitor like Netflix, the compensation of senior executives is tied to execution on strategic goals. Uh, you know, does, in order to compete long term, do the boards of both of your companies need to change how you're compensated so that you can properly compete? Meaning, are you disadvantaged by the way your compensation structure is built for you and your management teams? Over to you. I think you should start. <laughs> And if you would like to I'll, talk I'll, about I'll, pay I mean, equity, I'll start I you want, uh, <laughs> Look, I, uh, I am actually driven every day by doing the right thing. And yes, sometimes that means you have to go and be an advocate for your company with your owner to say, I think the right thing to do is to not grow earnings but rather make investments. We're making more technology investments in Turner today than in the company's history. And, and, and I've, thankfully for me, I've got a great boss and we've had an amazing relationship and more than the majority of the time he'll back me. Uh, I don't think we at Turner are making bad decisions to favor the near term versus the longer term. I, yes, I get, plenty of employees that like to come into my office and complain that we're measured off of a different stick than Netflix. You know what that is? Like, grow up. Because the first or second quarter, and they, by the way, they have done an amazing job. And I have crazy respect for Reed Hastings. I think he's probably one of the best CEOs in the country. But if they miss their subscriber targets and their strategic targets, the market will correct. I mean, the market is an incredibly self-correcting mechanism. So I don't go to sleep at night obsessing about what their market cap is versus what our market cap is. I go to bed at night obsessing about how do we grow our business and how do we make the right decisions. So I think by and large it works. Um, it's not perfect, but I don't feel handicapped in any way. Nancy, do you want to talk I mean, about it's a little equity? different for us because we're a private company. So I think you bring up an excellent point, Rich, that you know strategic objectives need more focus. And because of the nature, this is where the JV is an as an asset is a, is is a you know is an opportunity for us because we can do that, um, and we can work with the partners to say what's the priority this year in terms of how we're managing through this disruption, where we see growth inside of A plus E networks. Um, and what the focus is that they want from us. So it, we're in a little bit of a different situation um, than the public markets. Um, you know, and on the pay equity of it all, I think it, it, we have to, it is, a, it is a very complicated issue. It's not this person, you know, this person needs to be paid what this person, there's you know, breadth of experience, time in roles, uh, you know, it's a it's a very difficult thing to unpack, and I've um, we've done it at A and E Networks. Obviously, you can't have lifetime in your umbrella of brands and not address this. But it's not something that you go and you do, and then it's over, it's done. Pay equity is a way of life, and every time a new employee comes in, it has to be looked at. Every time you're making strategic decisions about how to reorganize, it has to be looked at. And I think you know we're. We're in a time of wanting absolutes and, and you know really soundbite answers to things, and this one doesn't have. It's it's going to be a way of life. It's not going to be a solution. We are almost out of time, but Lucas, I know you'll give us a really short question, and we'll get a really short answer. Very short, uh, for Nancy. You mentioned Vice being a good move from a distribution perspective, but the ratings for the network are kind of abysmal by any metric. I'd actually like to correct this. Okay. So it's it's a 24 month old channel. It's up 4% in prime year over year. It is being calculated that the stories that we've been getting about the ratings have been based on a fully distributed portfolio of networks. Viceland is in 50 million homes, which immediately puts it in a completely different viewership category than let's say History or CNN or you know, any of the big top 15, top 20 networks. So if you take just its distribution category and what its comps are doing, they certainly have a way to go, but they're proving 
to deliver the second uh, most upscale audience to Bravo and cable with about 22, 22 is that million. True? Yes. 69.7 is the average household income, men 18 to 49. That is a really difficult audience to reach, and we've grown that audience year over year. So the, the actual target, like the, the ratings capabilities of a network that's only in 54 million homes is probably about 150,000 impressions. And we're at 55,000 impressions in prime, and we're 24 months old. What do people want? Like, give us a shot here. And we grew year over year. So I think uh, it's, the, it's the do your homework part of reporting that's really dangerous and that not understanding the apples. We're comparing apples and oranges a lot when I think it's apples and, you know. Did it not, did it not drop from H2 pretty significantly in we year one? We knew that, and we made that calculated decision. From H2, you have history and H2, which were programmed together. We were moving the audiences back and forth between each other. <laughs> and that this was a long-term view, right? So we get penalized for not taking a long-term view. And then we take a long-term view, and we're penalized for abandoning the easy business. And so it, it definitely took a drop. I think H2 was around 75 to 80,000 impressions at the time when we made the switch. I see an H2 executive in the audience. Am I about right? <laughs> I'm right. So, you know, and I think, the, as I said earlier, the long-term view of that was going to be duplicative and aging like the other core networks versus taking a swing on something that we're trying to innovate with. Unfortunately, we're out of time because we could keep on going for, for twice as long. Um, but I want to thank Nancy Dubuque and John Martin. Thank, thank you, you so much. Well, thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.